Alabama STEM Explorers is made possible by the generous support of Hudson Alpha Institute for Biotechnology, Southern Research, solving the world's hardest problems, the Holly Family Foundation, Alabama Works, Alabama STEM Council, Alabama Mathematics, Science, Technology, and Engineering Coalition, Alabama Math, Science, and Technology Initiative. I love these little toy cars, don't you? You just wind them up and let them go. But not too far. Let's try this one. Oh, oh, goodness. Try this one. Oh, no. Oops. Man, that one went really fast. I wonder why. Let's find out. on today's episode of Alabama STEM Explorers. I'm Katherine. And I'm Anderson. And Anderson and I are here at Southern Research in Birmingham, Alabama. I was just telling Katherine about my cars, how I pulled one back way too far and it zoomed off of the table. Yeah, I heard that loud crash. Yeah, it was pretty bad. But I was wondering, why did it go so fast? That's a great question, Anderson. And I think we have the potential for a pretty cool experiment. What do you say we build a car right here in the laboratory? A real car here in the lab? Well, not a real car, but a mousetrap car. Oh, a mousetrap. Wait, is that a car that catches mice? No, not quite. A mousetrap car is just a, it's something like this. Ta-da! Oh, that's pretty cool. But how does it work? That's a really good question, Anderson, and it works by force and changes in motion. And so what happens is, let's take a look. So when you look at this mousetrap car, uh, and you look at the mousetrap, what part of the mousetrap do you think uh, would get the car moving? Hmm. Maybe the spring? Yeah, that's right, that's exactly right. So when this spring is compressed or when it's tightened, uh, that's when this bar is gonna be pulled all the way back, and that is going to allow us to store energy inside of the spring. Okay. Wait, energy out of a spring? Yeah, that's right. And to do that, we need to apply force to the car so that we can transform the energy. And so we can do that using this string. And so I'll show you. So as we roll our mousetrap car back, this fishing line or the string is gonna rotate and it's gonna wrap around that back axle. You see that? Yeah, I do. So, now our car is set? Yeah, that's exactly right. The car is set. And so the stored energy is called potential energy. And once the wheels are released like this, I'll show you, the spring will decompress and it'll pull this mousetrap car forward. And so the force of the spring will be the greatest whenever it's pulled all the way back. So force is just a fancy word for pushing or pulling. So I could push you pretty hard and that would be uh, exerting a lot of force or I could maybe pull you a little bit softer and that would be a little bit less force. Does that make sense? Yeah, but how does the spring make the car move again? Excellent question, Anderson. And so this string right here exerts a force on the bar of the mousetrap. And the cool thing about that is it's gonna allow this axle to rotate and our wheels to rotate. And at that point, we are transforming potential energy or the stored energy in the spring into energy in motion or what we call kinetic energy. But hey, Anderson, why don't we go on over to the Southern Research Speedway and let's race some mousetrap cars. Okay. Welcome to the Southern Research Speedway. What do you think, Anderson? It's pretty cool. Very cool, and I'm really excited uh, that you guys are here with us today. So, what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a look at two different versions of mousetrap cars. And now, when you're designing a mousetrap car, you can either design it for speed or you can design it for distance. So Anderson, between these two cars, which one do you think was designed to go the fastest? Hmm. Maybe this one because it's lighter? Hey, that's a really good hypothesis. Uh, and you know what we can do? We can test it out. And one of uh, my favorite equations uh, when you're working with mousetrap cars is to calculate speed. And the way we do that is by uh, 
divided, so you go distance divided by time. And you can think about this the same way as if you're driving in a car. So if you're going 60 miles an hour, that means that you can travel 60 miles within one hour. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes sense. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we are gonna calculate uh, speed and we're also gonna determine the distance that each of these two mousetrap cars travels, all right? And so what I want you to do, Anderson, is I want you to wind this one up. Okay. And then take it down to the beginning of the track. Okay. All right. Perfect. Is it wound? It's ready to go? It is ready. I think it's ready. Okay. All right. When I tell you go, you're going to let it go on your mark. Get set. Go. All right. So this mousetrap car went about three and a half meters in 5.7 seconds. So can you do some quick calculations for me? So I'm going to write three and a half meters. Okay. In 5.7 seconds. So remember, to calculate speed, you're going to calculate distance divided by time. So what is my speed? Let's see. Your time is 0 0.61. So our car traveled about uh, 0.6 meters in one second. So now that we have that data point, what we're gonna do is we are gonna test out the car with the long dowel. So are you ready? On your mark, get set, go. All right, and she's off. She's going, she's going, she's going. All right, and she can continue to go. She can continue to go. All right, so this one went 5.5 meters in nine and a half seconds. So let's calculate that. So we have 5.5 meters in 9.5 seconds. So what speed does that give me? Um, it gives you 0 0.57. 0 0.57 meters per second. So what we can tell from the data that we collected is that this car went faster, but it didn't go as far. So why do you think that might be? Well, maybe because this one has this add-on? Yeah, that's right. And it all comes down to mechanical advantage. And mechanical advantage is at play over and over again in these mousetrap cars. Because uh, it, it's at play, but it, it's sort of in reverse because it works both ways, right? So. Basically, when we, without the dowel, you are applying this force just over a, a shorter distance. And so all that force is being applied pretty quickly. But with the dowel, uh, what it's gonna do, it's gonna apply the same amount of force, but over a greater amount of time, which allows this mousetrap car to, to travel further. Does that make sense? Yeah, it makes a lot of sense now. So for our viewers at home, if you wanna build a mousetrap car, you don't need all of these fancy pieces. Uh, Anderson, why don't you grab that mousetrap car that you made the other day? Okay. So Anderson made a really cool mousetrap car and he just used some DVDs. And so all you really need is maybe some cardboard, some glue, DVDs, CDs, and a mousetrap. And what will that do, Anderson? It will feed, feed your needs need for speed. speed. Hi, my name is Shreya, and I've heard that hummingbirds can fly it upside down and backwards. Is that true? What a great question. Hummingbirds are the only birds that can fly backwards and upside down. The hummingbird is the only bird that can hover. It manages this by flapping its wings 20 to 80 times a second. It can fly straight up and straight down, backwards and forwards. The design of a hummingbird's wings differs from most other types of birds. Hummingbirds have a unique ball and socket joint at the shoulder that allows the bird to rotate its wings 180 degrees in all directions. The shape of their wings are long, narrow, and tapered, which allows them to move more quickly and easily through the air. Additionally, the shoulder and elbow joints of the wings are very close to their tiny bodies, allowing the wings to tilt and pivot. These characteristics allow hummingbirds to change flight directions in a way that other birds cannot. 
So I'm a process engineer in our general assembly shop. I'm responsible for managing the installation of equipment and process implementation and process improvements for the powertrain system. I'm responsible for managing the installation of robots or uh, managing, uh, teaching of those robots with our maintenance team. So that's part of my job. Um, implementing processes on how to actually assemble parts to the vehicle, um, as well as um, uh, improving parts um, so they can fit better to the vehicle. So that's just pretty much my, what I do here at Hyundai. So I would say that probably 30 years ago, I think it would be, if I could imagine what it would be, it'd be like a very manual process, um, very uh, hands-on. You probably could build one vehicle in probably like eight hours or something of that nature. Um, whereas today, you know, we have robots and we have conveyors and we have assist device um, to help us build those vehicles. And so now you can build one vehicle within, you know, three, four hours. If I had to think about the technology and how it's evolved, um, I think about like different features that vehicles have, like lane assist or, uh, you know, backup cameras. Um, I, we definitely didn't have those in our cars 10 years ago or five years ago, um, you know, blind spot detections and things like that. Coming to work here at Hyundai, I would say that, I mean, this place is fascinating um, at the rate of how we build our cars. Um, I mean, and just seeing all the different uh, type of robots and just, I mean, even though I work in General Assembly, but looking at the robots and welds and things like that, I mean, it is just so fascinating. So what I would tell my 13-year-old cousin or niece or my 13-year-old self, I would definitely say perseverance, hard work, tenacity, drive, patience uh, will definitely get you to become an engineer. Peterson and I are at Autobahn Indoor Speedway in Bessemer, Alabama. And we're here with our friend Jay, and he is gonna teach us about the science and the physics behind go-kart racing. All right, so starting off is speed. Speed is how fast the object moves in a given time. Now, do you know a few ways to measure speed? Um, miles per hour. Meters per second. And then there's also another one, kilometers per hour. Oh, oh. I didn't know about that yeah, one. Yeah, me either. Now, on to the next one is acceleration. So acceleration is the rate of the change in speed over a given time. Now, there are multiple different ways, multiple different types of acceleration, starting off which is increase in speed, decrease in speed, and a change in direction. Okay. That makes yeah, sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Change in direction, yeah. that one could be tricky. I wouldn't have thought of that right off the bat. Yeah, me neither. Yeah. Now, next up, I'm gonna step off the stage a little and let Sir Isaac Newton take over with his second law of motion that states that an object, that object will continue its direction and speed unless something causes it to stop. Now, in the go-kart, what will stop a race? Um, a flag? Brakes? Brakes. <sighs> now, slamming on your brakes creates friction. Oh, okay. Yeah, we know about friction. Yeah, we know about friction. Yeah. Now, when you're slamming on your brakes, that heats up the brake pads, causing your brakes, brakes to connect, stop, and you're officially slowed down. Hmm. Now, on the Sir Isaac Newton's first law of motion states that an object will not move unless something makes it move. Now, when you start it, your speed will increase, but what will cause you to slow down? Mm. Change in direction? There you go. Ha ha! Stick with me, Anderson, I got you. <laughs> now, we're on to momentum. Momentum is a continued motion of an object that is what will help you get through the turns. So for example, when you're trying to take a turn, you gotta think about how you're gonna take it. How you're gonna, if you're gonna try to take it sharp or take it wide, which comes into angles. So a sharp turn would be basically an acute angle, while a wide turn would be an obtuse angle. 
which angle do you think we should take? Like, should we do sharp turns, wide turns? How can I beat Anderson? You would like to do a mixture. Okay. So for some turns you want to keep it sharp, while some turns you want to take it a little bit wider to try to get around it easier while so having to slow down too much. Does anybody have any questions about anything? No, but I think it's pretty cool how cars do their thing. Yeah, there's a lot of science behind go-kart racing. Who knew? Mm -hmm. I'm ready, Anderson. Are you ready to go? I am definitely ready to destroy you. Uh, destroy. Okay, in your wildest dreams, Anderson. We will see on the track. All right, Anderson, here we are. We are ready to race. So first thing is first, we've got to put on our socks. Oh yeah, oh yeah, oh yeah, there we go. All right, and now what helmet would you like? Safety first, of course. Um, I think I'm gonna go with this one. All right, good, that's a good choice. I think I'm gonna grab this one. Okay, perfect. All right, let's suit up. You are so going down, Anderson, it is not <laughs> even gonna your be close. Dreams. All right, cool, we got our gear, we are ready to go. Helmets on. You're looking fine, Anderson. You're looking fine. <laughs> Whatever, I'm gonna win. In your dreams, Anderson, it is not even gonna be close. I was talking to your mama the other day and she said you drive like a grandma. <laughs> I said you look like a grandma. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll see you on the racetrack. Let's go. All right, I'll give you a head start. That's fine, Anderson. Go, Grandma, go! <laughs> You'll see. Oh no! Oh man, we're coming up on a big turn! Oh, here we go! Go, Anderson! Go, go, go! Oh, I'm so <laughs> glad I made that. That was so close. Yeah, that one was a close one. Yeah, these wheels are really, really spinning. And did you know that the wheels on these go-karts, they're actually designed for like the maximum friction to grip for those quick starts, which you are not doing a very good job at because you're so slow, uh, but also like quick stops and, and to hold their hold their course through these like G-force turns. Did you know that? <laughs> really? Woo! Yeah, absolutely. And the friction between the wheels and the track, they're different when the go-kart go is like at rest and then when the go-kart is, is in motion. It's so cool. There's so much physics going on. <laughs> I didn't know that but this is going really fast. Yeah, absolutely, and that friction force depends on the type of surfaces and contact and the weight of the object, so you are being supported. I'm coming up on this wall. <laughs> Wait, I'm turning right, but I'm going left in my seat. Ah, uh, I know why. Remember, Anderson, all objects at rest tend to stay at rest, while all objects in motion tend to stay in motion, unless a force causes them to change their motion. What was the force that just made you crash? Uh, I don't know. The wall! Yeah, that wall! That made you crash into the wall! Yeah, and so this is what Newton's first law of motion, uh, that's why it's called inertia. It's what inertia is all about. Uh, another thing that's really cool about it is inertia is also uh, the resistance to a change in motion in which like those larger objects are more difficult to change their motion than small objects. So think about it like this, Anderson. So you know how like a small hummingbird, it, it can move and it can turn super fast? Yeah, yeah, you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, and then like a large animal, like a giraffe, it, it seems to move in like slow motion. That all has to do with inertia. And then another thing, so when you come to a sudden stop, the reverse of what happens at the beginning of the race that occurs. I mean, so when you're in motion and then you come to an abrupt stop, you tend to keep moving, right? So just like when you crash, you're gonna keep on moving, your body's gonna keep on moving, oh. and it will Whoa. end up in front of the car if you're not secured by your seatbelt. So good thing uh, you are wearing your seatbelt. <laughs> yeah, I'm glad right now, because I'm taking the turn. Ah! like a hundred miles per hour? A hundred miles an hour? Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I don't know how fast we're going, but maybe. I mean, it is super, super fast. This is so crazy. 
super duper fast is an understatement. <laughs> and this is speed, right? So this is what we were talking about earlier, this speed, and there's two types of speed. Um, you can think about how far you went and how long it took. And, and that is like the speed limit side on the side of the road. And the other one uh, is more specific, and that includes what direction you're going. And in physics, that's called velocity. Velocicoaster? Man, oh, man, what a race, Anderson. I <gasps> told you it was not even gonna be close, and it wasn't. <laughs> oh gosh, that was a lot of fun. Oh yeah, that was definitely some fun, except for the crash. The crash was really scary. <laughs> it was a little scary. <laughs> it was scary, but not as scary as your hair right now. <laughs> your hair is scary. Uh, but yeah, so that crash was pretty cool. And that was just another example of Newton's first law of motion, right? I mean, your body, you were moving, you were going, you were, you know, you were, uh, you were in motion until something or the wall or my cart made you stop, right? And so that's why you felt your body move forward. Okay. But something that was also really cool was, you know how when we spun out a few times, yeah. Why do you think that is? Like, give me a science word that, that you think might be that reason. Maybe we didn't have enough friction? Oh, that is exactly right, Anderson. You were really smart. That's right. And so friction is a good thing. You need friction to, to actually be able to go. If there's no friction at all, there's no way your cart will move. But yeah, when there's, you've got to find that balance because uh, otherwise you're just going to spin out and it's going to go, it's going to go wild. Well, that's pretty crazy. Yeah, well, I had a lot of fun today. Um, and if our viewers at home want to have the time of their life, definitely come by and check this place out. You learn a lot of science and you have a lot of fun. Uh, and you beat kids like Anderson. And you have hair like hers. <laughs>
Thanks again for watching. We'll be back next week. Alabama STEM Explorers is made possible by the generous support of Hudson Alpha Institute for Biotechnology, translating the power of genomics into real-world results, Southern Research, solving the world's hardest problems, the Hawley Family Foundation, established to honor the legacy of Brigadier General Everett Hawley and his parents, Evelyn and Fred Hawley, champions of servant leadership. Alabama Works, a network of interconnected providers connecting business and industry needs to a highly skilled and trained workforce. Alabama STEM Council, dedicated to improving STEM education, career awareness, and workforce development across Alabama. Alabama Mathematics, Science, Technology, and Engineering Coalition for Education, advocating for exceptional STEM education in Alabama. Alabama Math, Science, and Technology Initiative, the Alabama Department of Education's initiative to improve math and science teaching statewide.